Okay, so we're 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 continuing on now. We we are uh, finishing up chapter one of Titus, and uh, and then we'll we'll move straight on into uh, chapter two. We we got very close to coming to the conclusion of chapter one, but um, missed it by a couple of verses. So we'll we'll complete that and then step into chapter two. Now be, before we um, before we do, I, there was something that I did want to review because I think this is important not to lose track of this uh, when we're thinking about the person of Titus, that Titus was described as an uncircumcised Greek. And that uh, we know that from Galatians chapter two, verse three, but neither Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. Uh, now we note that Titus, we had this, this was back in our introduction when we first started the study in Titus. I'm just gonna do a quick little review about Titus so that this, these thoughts are not lost. That Titus accompanied Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem and where they met with the elders in Jerusalem. And remember now the elders in Jerusalem are, and the whole uh, body, which is in Jerusalem, is the kingdom church. So they believe the gospel of the kingdom, which is that Jesus is the Christ. Paul has now a different gospel. And he's, he met with Paul, Barnabas, and Titus with them, that were, which were of reputation. And they debated. There was a, there was a contentious uh, discussion among the three of them concerning the gospel that Paul was preaching among the Gentiles. And then uh, in Galatians 2, 1 and 2, we read, then 14 years ago, after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, uh, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Those, of, those that were of reputation, those are the elders. Those are the ones that are uh, the, one, the significant members in the, uh, in the group. And the concern about running or had run in vain was that there was, there was distress about what it was that Paul was preaching. And, and we know that when, when Paul came back to Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey, he was literally, he was attacked by those in Jerusalem for the things that he was saying. So he didn't want it to spread around Jerusalem what he was preaching because they would not understand. Now, Titus was with Paul. And my point is this, you know, had Titus been an ethnic Greek Gentile, note this, an ethnic Greek Gentile of the nations, he would have also been ignorant of both Hebrew, the Hebrew language, the Hebrew scriptures. I might add, he would also have been ignorant of Hebrew traditions. He would really know nothing about those things, but Paul had him in company. If he had been an ethnic Greek, he would have been no knowledgeable assistance to Paul. So I conclude that, Paul, that Titus, even being called a Greek, was not an ethnic Greek. He was a Greek by culture. He was actually a Hebrew. And because he was a Hebrew, he knew the traditions, he knew the scriptures, he knew the teachings, and he could be with Paul a partner and a fellow helper. Now, those are lofty terms for Paul to consider Titus a partner, my partner and fellow helper is a very lofty reference, something that I, I could never imagine stepping up to that level of being a partner of uh, the Apostle Paul. And yet that's what Titus was. That to me pretty well corks it that he was a Hebrew, familiar with the scriptures, he knew the scriptures, and when Paul spoke to him, 
he could understand exactly based on the scriptures and the revelation that came to Paul, this new matter of salvation by grace. So for as well yes. as being a Hebrew, yes. he was uncircumcised. And he yes, and he was <laughs> he was uncircumcised. So for one to be at this level with Paul, that is a partner and a fellow helper, one would have to be knowledgeable of the Hebrew scriptures, thus a Hebrew. The only help a Gentile of the nations might provide Paul, which would include me, would be to carry his bags from city to city. That's all I could do, because I know nothing beyond what Paul has said. All right, now we're going to move back into chapter one of Titus. And to finish up, we've got, we were very close. We've got a couple of verses and we'll start by doing just a little bit of uh, reading to, to get pull the context back into view for folks. So Vivian will be reading as we move towards verses 15 and 16 at the end of this chapter. Uh, we're reading in Titus chapter one, starting at verse 10, going to halfway through verse 13. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Paul said, he agreed. This is a true statement about. The Cretans. Uh, Brother uh, Van? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> I've always struggled with this passage. Um, okay, so even a prophet of their own said they are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. So among them, this prophet is one of those. Uh, um, vain talkers and deceivers also yes like, uh, and and also we call them uh, there are of the circumcision also yeah so th this prophet that uh, that uh, paul is referencing this prophet isn't such a great guy himself yes okay oh, that's that's but, but he agrees testimony. he agrees with with this testimony. with his testimony with his admission about about the Cretans. Okay, thank you. I wrestled right. that for years. Okay. <laughs> All right, picking up in the next slide. Yeah. Uh, picking up in the middle of verse 13. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Okay, so just before we leave this slide, the uh, Paul uh, writes here about the unbelieving and the context, I want to put back uh, before us all, the context is that they are unbelieving of the truth. You know, they're, they're in ministry. You know, they're, they're not um, atheistic. They don't, it's, it's not that they are worshiping of idols. They believe in God. Uh, they believe that salvation is in God, but they are now unbelieving of the truth. And, and that's the issue here. And from that unbelieving of the truth, all matter of problems stem. And, and this is where he says, now nothing is pure. Then now he says in verse 15, it says unto the pure. Now should define this. What is the pure? Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Note that nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Now, the pure, as and, I, and this is this is as put forward by the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, 
it, it use as an absolute term, uh, one of the senses is a, as an absolute term of persons. So of a person. That is, someone that's called pure is free from moral, note the word, defilement. Defilement. And here we're talking in this verse 15 about conscience, mind and conscious being defiled. So Paul notes here, there are those that are pure, that is that their mind and conscience, there's no defilement. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary also quotes the 1526 Tyndale Bible, and it says, Titus 1.15, unto the pure, all things are pure. That's exactly as presented in the tin. I don't have a copy of the Tyndale Bible, but the Oxford English Dictionary, in confirming to the reader uh, the use of a word, will pull into view verses from Bibles to show that the sense of understanding is correct. So it is correct for me to understand here in this verse 15, unto the pure, that the, the definition is that they are free from moral defilement. So I do that, I understand that now from the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, Paul goes on to say, unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And we and I and I discovered from the Oxford Dictionary that this word defiled um, has a very specific definition. It means it is uh, defined as being polluted, sullied. And if you're not familiar with the word sullied, that means soiled. That their mind and conscience is soiled. And so that's why I was uh, we talked a little bit about why sometimes we refer today to folks having a dirty mind. Well, it has a precedent in usage, a mind that is soiled. So he says, unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving. So now we, we cover two areas. The defiled means uh, being soiled in their moral thinking, unbelieving of the truth. Those are, those are two things now that Paul is covering. Paul says, is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. So these held that sin does not matter because there is nothing pure. And this was a doctrine that was shared by many. In fact, it still floats around even to this day. Sin doesn't matter because there is nothing pure. That is characteristic of those that have a mind which is defiled and they are unbelieving of sound doctrine. And conscience doesn't matter. And so, yes, so then we go on that mind and conscience is defiled. So a mind and conscience that is defiled is no longer able to detect or discern or can tell right from wrong, good from bad. They're actually crippled in their ability. Their mind is and their conscience is not functioning as it should if it had if it were in fact uh, uh pure so now i can understand why there are some matters there are some topics with some that always escape agreement there are things which to me are just things that are clearly right and things that are just plainly wrong and yet there are those that'll that'll squarely say no, I think it's right to do that. Even when I say, well, that's completely inconsistent with, with biblical morality, and they don't see it. They can't tell. So they are unable to come to a proper conclusion of what's good and what's bad. That's why I end up with an argument 
that becomes emotional and distressed, a shouting match, and you go, why can't they see it? It's because their mind and conscience is defiled. So then I conclude it's pointless. If their mind is defiled, there's no point in me attempting to engage them in a rational discussion about what's right and wrong. They cannot detect it anymore. Yeah, that's still right there for leaders. Yeah, and they're still, yet, notice this, in verse 16, they profess that they know God. Wow, this means that someone who is professing to know God can still, can yet have a, uh, a mind and conscience which is defiled. This is difficult to accept, but I think we have evidence of that in people that say that, yes, they believe God, but then they also maintain that certain things are acceptable and they will pursue certain things. So Paul says they profess they know God, but in works, what they do, they deny him. Now, here Paul is specifically talking about the Cretans. Those are the they. They profess they know God. But Paul says that they, the Cretans, are always, and that word always is perpetually. Uh, and we define that always differs from the word always, spelt with an S. Always with an S is at every occasion. But always is like, perpetually. They are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. So I think, you know, I could think of those that what, every time they open their mouth, a lie is coming out, even though they may say they know God. So they profess they know God, but in works deny him being abominable, now watch the definition of these words, abominable, exciting disgust and hatred. That's what they stir up. They stir up disgust and hatred, uh, evidence of ill qualities, both physical or moral. They are offensive, loathsome, odious, detestable. So Paul says, being abominable. And then he says disobedient, and we know what the word disobedient is, that is not obedient. And then, and unto every good work, reprobate. Galatians 3, 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Now, this is what Paul says, not obey the truth. That's very specific to the doctrine that he is teaching. And there were those, especially false brethren, that were coming into the Galatians and they were spreading, uh, spreading doctrines which were trying to persuade the Galatians to not obey the truth. And then Paul credentializes himself. He says, I gave you the truth. And he says, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently set forth. So Paul saw the resurrected Christ. He saw the crucified Christ resurrected. And he says, I'm the one that has given you the truth. You've got these who are coming into you and they're bewitching you. That is, they are, they are tricking you. They're persuading you that you should not obey the truth. Can I just ask you yes. a question? Yeah. Somebody asked, are the Cretans, the slow bellies, are yes. they Greeks, meaning are they of the Hebrews, uncircumcised Hebrews, or would they be of the circumcision? Well, it, it, evidently they were of both because Paul says that, um, they include the circumcision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were so, so there were Cretans. Now that a Cretan now is a nationality of Crete. Yeah, a na nation of that. Yes. Yeah. So they were both circumcised and uncircumcised uh, Hebrews living in Crete, and so they were a mixed group, and they were together reprobate 
So we talked about being abominable and then reprobate, which is depraved, <clears throat> degraded, morally corrupt. So this, this, is the, this is the situation that was facing Titus in Crete. Uh, and just uh, an amazingly difficult situation that Paul was uh, uh, asking Titus to address in his work and ministry in the uh, in the in Crete. Okay, so we're we're complete with chapter one, and we're going to move into chapter two. Unless there's any any additional questions before we move. Okay, chapter two. And we'll start with reading. Titus chapter two. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. <clears throat> Interesting. The purpose here is that the word of God be not blasphemed. That word blaspheme points to irreverence or, or spoken of irreverently. So back at the, at the top now, chapter 2, starting at verse 1. But speak thou the things which become, that is, to make something becoming, that is, to, um, uh, to, to be... Uh, Enhance it. enhance it or to be suitable uh things which are suitable becoming to sound doctrine not that sound doctrine needs to become sound it is sound but paul is telling titus to speak things which enhance sound doctrine and then he speaks first to paul addresses the aged men so the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in the faith, in charity, that's love, in patience. So those are the, these are the qualities that Paul gives to Titus for, look, for looking for in the aged men. And then next Paul addresses the aged women. Likewise, that their behavior, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And notice this, that the aged women, that they may teach the young women. So there's, there's the priority and as there's the order. Note it's the aged women that are to teach the young women, not the aged men. The aged men are not instructed to teach young women. The aged women are instructed to teach young women, uh, and that is that they be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. See, this is coming now from a senior woman to the young woman on how their behavior should be, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. This is the proper order in a Hebrew home that the word of God be not blasphemed. Not yes. another person's husband. Not a, <laughs> yes, not another Their person. own husbands. Their own husbands. Keep their own husbands. Okay, then we move on now to verses 6 through 8. Titus chapter 2, starting at verse 6. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. All right, so we'll look at this in detail. Now, finally, so of the, 
of the four groups, the aged men, the aged women, the young women. And then lastly, Paul addresses the young men. So the young men likewise exhort to be sober minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Um, I just make a, a quick comment here. You see in the King James Bible, it's uh, showing S-H-E-W-I-N-G. So I've, I've studied this word and I cannot find in the Oxford Dictionary there to be any difference between showing spelt with an E and showing spelt with an O that they both mean, they both are, uh, uh, have the same understanding. So there's no reason to, for me to stress myself out and try and pronounce something that doesn't make any uh, defined difference. So showing thyself a pattern of good works. Um, I, I thought that was pronounced she wing. It, well, it may be. Old English. It old English. Mm -hmm. but I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> she win. <laughs> I know a she win. <laughs> so a pattern. So Paul, I'll note here that Paul's instruction to Titus is that that Titus is to be a pattern of good works. Now Paul himself was the ensemble. Now an ensemble we have before defined is the precedent. So Paul was a precedent. He doesn't instruct Titus to try and be a precedent. He says, Titus, you follow me. I'm the precedent. You are a pattern. So follow what I show you and then be a pattern for others of good work. So Paul followed the precedent of, or rather Titus followed the precedent of Paul and was a pattern for others. And then Philippians 3.17, we read here that where Paul writes, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so ye have us for an ensemble. And that word ensemble, that's where we get the, uh, the word precedent. And then Paul writes, I, well, I'll read okay. here, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, that is, you know, being seriously uh, grounded, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So this is the importance of behavior. This, these, these words are very straightforward. And Paul is, is emphasizing here to Titus the importance of his behavior so that those that disagree with you aren't going to be able to pick you apart based on your behavior. They will have no evil thing to say of you. That's a very, that's a very high standard. And nothing that I could step up to today myself. But Titus, being gifted, uh, could step up to that. Paul could expect him to perform. Okay. All right. So now we're going to move on into verses 9 and 10. Titus 2, starting at verse 9. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And so he speaks here to exhort servants. So there were servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Not answering again is, uh, is, is just the old English way of saying, don't talk back. So I know that of the uncircumcised Hebrew were those that were servants of the circumcision. This is something you may not be familiar with, and it's something that we've had to do a little work to understand ourselves. 
but this is something that is uh, true of the Hebrews. They were uncircumcised. They were those that were servants of the circumcision. Let me show. First Corinthians, verse, chapter 7, verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. So first of all, servanthood for these Hebrews was part and parcel of the work that they were doing. They were to think of themselves as servants, whether or not they were free or not free. And there, there were those that were not free. Exodus 21, 2. Exodus 21, 2. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. So notice this. If thou buy a Hebrew servant. So there were those Hebrews that may have put themselves up for sale as a servant because of maybe debt or whatever financial issues. And so money could be spent and a servant could be purchased. But then the provision was that that had to be retired in a maximum period of six years because in the seventh year, yeah. he, would have to, he would have to go out free and for, and for no additional cost. That was the law of liberty under Moses. Uh-huh, yeah. okay. Now, something else is very interesting. Still talking about servants. Jeremiah 34, and then the entire passage, I'll just note here, is verses 8 to 17. Jeremiah 34, 8 to 17. And you may want to just take a look at this, if, especially if you're not familiar with it, because it deals with this matter of servanthood. And we'll just pick up on this one verse. This is Jeremiah 34, verse 9 only. Vivian will read. Jeremiah 34, verse 9. That every man should let his manservant and every man his maidservant, being an Hebrew or an Hebrewess, go free, that none should serve himself of them, to wit, of a Jew his brother. So you see the class system that was very much in, in, in fact, it was not only then, but even in Paul's day, there was a class system. The Jew was the, there was a Hebrew that was a Jew was, was in the top yeah. echelon. They were the religious ones, ruling class. the ruling class. And then the servants being a Hebrew or Hebrewess. They, they, they could be the uncircumcised. And they, you know, notice that they're not referred to as a Jew. They're referred to as being a Hebrew or Hebrew. So they, they could very well have been of the uncircumcised. And they are in and amongst those that are Jews. And that they could be purchased and be made a servant. And uh, the fact that they were Hebrews is... Uh telling that they were descendants of Abraham, the Hebrew, yes. in Genesis 14, 13. Yeah. So this is something for me to know, that uh, there was this matter of service, servanthood, and there was, a, there was this class system here between those that were Jews and those that were not referred to as, as Jews, just as Hebrews and Hebrewesses. So and who knew? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knew that they were servants? Hey, Van. Yes, David. Um, when James writes about uh, the perfect law of liberty, does that relate in any way to, uh, uh, even in a spiritual sense, to what uh, uh, what we're talking about? Because I've always wondered about that verse. I would have to spend some time thinking about it, David, before I tried to answer that. Um, yeah, no, I don't want. Well, look and get back. Yeah, no, I don't want to just. I don't want to just pop off the top of my head with something because I don't know what I'm talking about until I spend a little bit of time in considering it. Except that they would be following Christ's commands to love one another and yes. perfect love, yeah, uh, one for another. Yeah. 
Okay. Sorry, David. <laughs> so your picture, yeah. your picture is... Uh... Yeah, the, the, my picture here is a servant attending to a Jewess. So a, a, he, a Hebrew attending to a, to a Jewess in service, helping her with her jewelry. <laughs> the jewelry. <laughs> All right, moving along. Not purloining. And that word, so this is regarding servants now. Servants, not purloining. You say, well, what's purloining? That is to commit petty theft. So the servant was not to be one who would go around stealing things in the home where they were. And that is, that's also the Oxford Dictionary notes the 1611, our King James Bible refers to Titus 2.10. There's a verse that we're looking at and defines purloining as being to com commit petty theft. And then, but not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. So what's fidelity? I know what high fidelity is when I play a record, but fidelity, this is a good fidelity, a person's trustworthiness. Now notice, Paul didn't write of showing all good faithfulness, the word isn't faithfulness, the word is fidelity, because what is to be communicated here is that the individual is to be trustworthiness. So then, for, then I understand that uh, faithfulness doesn't necessarily point to trustworthiness. So just because somebody's called faithful doesn't mean they're trustworthy. If the King James Bible wants to communicate being trustworthy. This is the word it would use, fidelity. That communicates trustworthy. The word faithful communicates the understanding of believing. Someone that is faithful is one that believes. That they may adorn the doctrine of God in all things. So there's the purpose, not purloining in all good fidelity, the purpose being that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Okay, now we'll move on into verses 11 to 15. Titus 2, starting at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Okay, so looking at verses uh, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So notice here, we're talking about the grace of God hath appeared to all men. Now let's just spend a moment and refresh our understanding of the word grace. Grace equals receiving something undeserved. That could be like a kindness, a gift, something like that. Grace is to receive something undeserved. And grace is at the discretion of the one who may offer it. So in other words, Somebody may decide to offer a kindness. Someone may decide to offer a gift, but they're under no obligation to do so. So that's just to receive something without uh, a, an obligation to offer it. That's grace. Now, mercy is different. Mercy equals to not receive something that is deserved. Classically, it's punishment. So those guilty of lawbreaking 
are those, uh, the individual that has been deemed guilty of breaking a law at the discretion of their judge, that is at the discretion of the one who found them guilty of breaking some statute, some law, uh, that judge may grant mercy. Withholding the punishment. Which would be to either withhold the punishment or to lessen the punishment, anything of that nature. So mercy is a, a lessening or a removal of punishment, whereas grace is to receive something at the discretion of the one who has decided to offer it. So here back now in Titus 2.11, the grace of God, well, looky here hath appeared to all men. Wow, so grace, God at his discretion has decided to now offer, offer it to all men, not just some men, but all men. <clears throat> now, both grace and mercy are at God's discretion. And we see here, we're going to look at some examples of these, uh, of of how this, this word comes up in scripture. Exodus 33, 19. Exodus 33, 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, that is to Moses, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So you see here, this is a great verse for showing the discretion that God has to be gracious or not gracious, merciful or not merciful on those he on which he decides. Except that when we get to Titus 2.11, now there's a change. Grace hath appeared to all men. So this declaration is unique to the present dispensation of the grace of God. Before this, God was limited as to who saw grace. But now with this declaration, we have uh, a change. So previously to the, to the dispensation of the grace of God, grace was limited to those who found grace. Quote, those who found grace with God. So now we see Titus 2.11 is telling me that there's a change in dispensation. So some of those that found grace with God. Now, this is prior to the grace of God appearing to all men. Before that, there were those that found grace with God. There's Genesis 6.8. Genesis 6.8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then we have Exodus 33, 17. Exodus 33, 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Interesting. Thou hast found grace. I know thee by name. And then? Judges chapter 6, verse 17. And he, that's speaking of Gideon, and he said unto him, the Lord, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. So then we have Gideon, Gideon who found grace in the sight of the Lord. Now we can also look at some of those that had obtained mercy with God. Hosea chapter 2 verse 23, those that obtained mercy. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say unto them, which were not my people, thou art my people. And they shall say, thou art my God. So these are, these are words then of the prophet speaking uh, as God has directed that God has said, I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. So here is the discretion of God in with, with respect to Israel, having mercy on those of his people. 
And then we read in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Okay, so Peter, and I take this as Peter writing to the rebellious, the uncircumcised. Peter is also speaking of them, which in time past, oh my, time past? So in time past, we're not a people, but now, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So time past and but now concerns the Hebrews. Time past, but now. So these are terms that Paul uses in Ephesians, but look who else is using them. And the context here is speaking about Hebrews. So time past and but now concerns Hebrews. So my apologies to the RD timeline because time past and but now and in the ages to come were, are primarily focused on the Hebrews and the separation that is there, not between Gentile nations, Gentiles of the nations and, and Israel. Let's look a little bit more at those that obtained mercy with God. First Timothy chapter one, verse 16. Howbeit for this cause, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Okay, so Paul says, I, for this cause, I obtained mercy. So there was a reason for him obtaining mercy. And that reason was that he, Paul, should be a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting to life everlasting. So question, for a pattern to them, who's them? Others in need of mercy, right? Remember, mercy is to withhold a judgment, a punishment that was appropriate under a judgment. So others in need of mercy, I obtained mercy, Paul says, as a pattern to them. So there were those then that are guilty under the law. Who were those guilty under the law? Well, it included very definitely the uncircumcised Hebrews who were breakers of the covenant of circumcision. They broke it. They needed mercy. So this is nothing to do with the Gentiles of the nations. This is Paul is and to, to Timothy. This is very importantly focused because of the word mercy. I know this because of the word mercy. It's not I obtained grace. I obtained mercy. I'm not under the law, so I don't need. I'm not in need of mercy. I'm in need of grace. Paul obtained mercy as a pattern. So it's nothing to do with the Gentiles of the nations. The Gentiles of the nations never under the law and therefore not in need of mercy, but we Gentiles of the nations are in need of grace. Okay, so that, that's quite a bit I covered there. And that's going to take a little time to digest. You're going to probably want to look at that again. But we're going to move on now into verse 13, where Paul writes, uh, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So Paul writes, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So it is pervasive throughout all Christian teaching that the blessed hope and the glorious appearing are a single event. 
the glorious appearing, the second coming of Christ. Well, I know from the English, rules of English, that when I see a comma and the word and, I'm looking at a list. So I understand now from the punctuation and the, and the way the sentence is structured that the blessed hope is item number one. Next on the list is item number two, the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the blessed hope is Paul affirming the truth of the rapture of the body of Christ. That is the blessed hope. Now, the blessed hope, the rapture, is an event that precedes the second advent, which is the glorious appearing. And that's exactly the way Paul presents it. First the rapture, and then there's a period of time that will lead to the glorious appearing of God. And he's also the savior of his people. So that blessed hope is the called saints and body of Christ, uh, what the, the glorious appearing is to the kingdom saints. So for us, we're focused on the blessed hope. The kingdom saints are focused on the glorious appearing. Now I'm going to go a little bit farther with this, the blessed hope. And Paul speaks of the blessed hope. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So there is the hope of his calling. And then Colossians 1.5. Colossians 1.5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. This is, this, this is the significance of the word hope. It's the hope of his calling, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. And then... 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. And then... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So again, here's this matter of hope being uh, put in view. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men most miserable. So if there is no hope beyond life, then Paul says we are of all men most miserable. But in fact, Paul points out there is hope beyond this life. Second Timothy chapter four, verse one. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. So now we've we've uh, we've moved on in topic. We were talking about the blessed hope. Now we're talking about the glorious appearing. Notice the glorious appearing is when Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that is those that are alive and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. So Paul speaks about the glorious appearing and characterizes exactly what's going to happen at the glorious appearing. Now, sometimes things are just left at that, and we get kind of a foggy notion of the difference between the blessed hope and the glorious appearing, uh, and they're, they're two different events. So what, I, what I, we thought to do, and this is uh, something that I've never seen done before, but we... I attempted it, and so what I'm going to show you now is a comparison chart. So on this comparison chart, I'm we're going to look at the blessed hope, which is on the left, and the glorious appearing, which is on the right. 
and we're going to examine. Um, so those are the two topics. Then we're going to look at who, we're going to look at when, we'll look at why, we'll look at how, where, location, or that is the final destination, and then we'll look at division. How are things divided? All right, so let's fill in the chart. So the blessed hope, the blessed hope concerns the body of Christ. So that's Jesus, the body of Christ. And I take my reference for that is 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now we're not going to go into these verses in detail, otherwise we will we'll never finish, but you've got the references. And so you can go back to this and look at it. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 27 uh, reads in part that ye are now the body of Christ. That's where I get the body of Christ. It's Paul specifically says this to the Corinthians. Ye are now the body of Christ. That's the blessed hope. Now the glorious appearing has to do with Israel, my people. And I take this now from, from 1 Samuel 12, 29. There's a lot going on in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2. Well, there's a lot going on in 1 Samuel, period. But in, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, verse 29, I read the words, Israel, my people. So now I understand who prophetically has to do with Israel, my people. Then there's the matter of when. So when is the blessed hope going to happen? The blessed hope will happen when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's Romans 11.25. That's when it's going to happen. And Romans 11.25 reads in part, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now in the glorious appearing, when is... It'll happen when Israel calls on the Lord. That's Zechariah 13.9. Zechariah 13.9 reads in part, They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. Who is my people? Israel. So the, the glorious appearing will happen when Israel calls on the Lord. Now we'll look at the word, or we'll look at the sense of why. Why is this going to happen? Well, the blessed hope, that is the body of Christ, its removal from the earth. Again, Romans 11.25, what results from that is that it will be the end of blindness in part for Israel. Interesting. When the body of Christ is removed, blindness in part, it's, but only in part, will end for Israel. Paul says blindness in part will end because two-thirds of Israel is going to remain in denial as to the truth of God. Only a third is going to be accepting of the truth of God. Whoops. Now that's that's for why the why the body of Christ is going to be removed is going to end blindness in part for Israel. Now why will it happen for Israel, the glorious appearing? It'll happen because they call and the call will be Jeremiah 31 7. It is Lord save me. So they're going to be calling for salvation. They're going to be in a situation where they're going to finally, Israel will call on the Lord for salvation. That's why the glorious appearing is going to happen. A very different reason. They're calling for salvation. Now we'll look at how. How will the blessed hope happen? It is Jesus. It is the high calling of God. That's Philippians 3.14. Philippians 3.14 reads in part, I press toward the mark. This is Paul saying, I press toward the mark 
for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The high calling of God, that is a calling up. It's a directional call. Paul says, I press towards being called up. That's the high calling of God. Now the high, now the how on the glorious appearing is, this is the Lord saying, I will save thy people. This is how it's going to happen for the glorious appearing. Um, <clears throat> Zechariah 8, 7, actually 7 and 8, but principally verse 8. Behold, I will save my people. Who is my people? Who is he saving? Israel. I will save my people, thy people. Now, where? There's differences here. Where? For the blessed hope is meeting Jesus in the clouds, in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians 4.17, which reads, We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So it, the, the blessed hope concerns a meeting that is, that is where? It's in the clouds, in the air. Now, what about the glorious appearing? Where is it? It's Jesus coming to the Mount of Olives. We know this from Zechariah 14.4. Notice how all of these are prophetic. Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives. Where's the Mount of Olives? It's on the earth. He's coming to the earth. Zechariah 14.4, which reads in part, and his verse and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is, be, is in front of Jerusalem. And that's where the glorious appearing is going to happen. It's actually on the earth. Whereas the blessed hope, it's in the clouds, in the air. Then the final location. Jesus for the body of Christ. The body of Christ is seated together in heavenly places. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. So th that's where the body of Christ is going to be located, seated together in heavenly places. Whereas the glorious appearing results in Jesus being seated on the earth. And we take that from Luke 22, 30. Luke 22, 30 that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's all happening on the earth. There's nothing of that kind of verbiage for the body of Christ. The body of Christ is removed. It goes up and is seated in heavenly places, whereas Jesus returns to the earth, to the Mount of Olives, and then he takes his disciples, the apostles, and they become judges with him on the earth. And then finally, division. Division, that is, how, is this, how are these things separated? Well, the blessed hope is mystery. And in Romans 16, 25, we read that this is mystery that is kept secret. It has been kept secret since the world world began now the now concerning the glorious appearing there's no secrecy here you can see yourself we can all see that all of this has been stated through the ages through through the years uh, by the prophets and so paul paul himself says that this is that which has been promised afore that's romans 1 verse 2. So prophecy, the glorious appearing, concerns a prophetic promise, whereas the blessed hope, the rapture of the body of Christ, concerns something that had been kept secret. In other words, Jesus did not speak about the rapture in John chapter 14, uh, which is famously uh, thought of Jesus saying to his disciples, uh, when I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. No, 
it, Paul says it was kept a secret. So if it was kept a secret, Jesus is not speaking about it in John chapter 14. Only Paul reveals the secret. Okay, so that's, that's a chart that differentiates both the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. I hope that's a little of a little bit of help. You can go through that again and check out the scriptures and see that the main difference is that the glorious appearing is all prophetic, whereas the blessed hope is all mystery. Okay, so I need to, let's see. We've got a few minutes left. We're going to move on. Oh, okay into verse 14. So we've talked about the, uh, the glorious appearing, the, the, uh, the, the uh, blessed hope and the glorious appearing. And then we have here, uh, Paul goes on to say, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So we have here, who gave himself for us, now, I don't want to dis distress us, but in fact, Matthew 1, 21, we read, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So when Paul writes, who gave himself for us, the primary pointer here is to that of Israel, because Jesus came to save his people from their sins. It has to start with Israel first before it can come to the Gentiles of the nations. So it's no reason for me to be stressed out about the order. It's, it's the order is Israel has to be made right first, and then the rest of us, Gentiles of the nations, now have opportunity. Then we read in verse 14, who gave himself for us. Now, interesting, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6. Isaiah 53, starting at verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. <clears throat> All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one unto his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So I take when Isaiah is writing here in this 53rd chapter about for our transgressions, for our iniquities, our peace, we are healed, we like sheep. All these terms refer to not Gentiles of the nations, the sheep are Israel. So, so the, the prophet here is saying, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. So Isaiah writes concerning Israel, not concerning the Gentiles of the nations. Israel has to be made right first. Then he writes that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Again, it starts with Israel. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, we read, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So notice this word redemption, redeem, comes into view. To redeem them that were under the law. So that makes it pretty clear to me that we're not dealing about, we're not dealing with Gentiles of the nations because Gentiles of the nations are not under law. So who needs to be redeemed? Well. Psalm 25, 22, redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Redemption starts with Israel. Jeremiah 15, 21, again, this is concerning Israel. Jeremiah 15, verse 21, and I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Interesting, the words here, I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. Who is the wicked? I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. So all of this is speaking of Isaiah 49, 24, the lawful captive. So Satan is the one who holds lawfully captive Israel. And so Israel needs to be redeemed 
And that's why Christ came and paid the price to redeem his people in order that the world itself can be saved. So all, all of this is speaking about Israel and the lawful captive. They're the ones that need to be redeemed. They're the ones that are in need of mercy. And then we read, and to purify himself a peculiar people. Not an odd people, but a peculiar people. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 26, verse 18. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and thou shouldest keep all his commandments. And then? First uh, Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, so this is what uh, Paul is speaking of when he talks about a peculiar people. It's a peculiar people for this purpose. And then we read, zealous of good works. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So these words were intended as encouragement to the call to be saints. Paul is trying to, is working to encourage them to be zealous, that is very keen, to do good works. And then we come to the final verse, 15, these things speak and exhort, and that word exhort means to warn earnestly and rebuke, that is to reprimand for a fault, that is to shame, with all authority. So today, these things aren't to happen. Today, we are all equal. There's nobody that's over me to exhort me there's nobody over me to rebuke me. Doesn't matter what school they went to or what kind of color they wear. We're all the same. And th this authority was limited to those that were the called that worked with Paul. And then he says, finally, he says, let no man despise thee. That is based on the way Timothy or Titus was to conduct himself. Especially because he was a young man. He was, yes. One of the young men. One of the younger men. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then that brings us to the end of chapter two. And next time we'll pick up at chapter three.